First, I wanted to say thank you uh, to the playwrights from whom we'll be hearing today. That's Katrina Kankova and Anastasia Kosti. It's a real honor to have you both here. Um, I also wanted to thank Camden People's Theatre for hosting us and Ukrainian Institute London for co producing together with Birkbeck Center for Contemporary Theatre. And uh, lastly, I wanted to thank uh, uh, several organizations who have supported this evening and made possible, including Birkbeck Institute for Gender and Sexuality and the Open Society's Experimental Humanities Collaborative Network. Я переїхала з Донецька після початку там. Із двома дітьми текла. Колишній чоловік на тому боці. Просто дуже боялися. Він такий владний. Він має таке становище в Донецьку, що він би мене убив і йому б нічого не було. У мене вся зброя була в роті. Він мені й погрожував, і вивозив, і тримав у підвалі. So there we sat, waiting for it all to end. Planes were flying so low, they were right above your head. The building was shaking, terrifying. We had no more electricity, water, or gas. Bitter cold. We all slept in the corridor in puffer jackets. My friend rang. So we went. We calmed down almost immediately. Water, light, warmth. We could relax. Everyone had bedded down, and I was lying there on my phone. They say that if you hear a whistle, the shell isn't coming for you. It'll pass by. But there was silence. I looked up, and like in the Matrix, a shell burst straight into the flat, through the window. Slowly. For me, it happened slowly. <coughs> Shards of glass, chunks of plaster, so much dust, so much everything. It seemed to me that the building swelled up and then deflated. The shell flew in, and I thought that I could stop it, grab it, catch it with my bare hands, because it was flying towards, towards the room where my child was. I jumped up and ran. I looked. She was whimpering, concrete on her head. You couldn't see shit. There was a cloud of dust. I had only one thought, please let her head be intact. At home, she used to sleep with a pillow over her ear, and that saved her. I looked, phew, it seems it's in one piece. And then my elder daughter said, mom, her legs. Що я пам'ятаю про кровотечу? Буває венозна і артеріальна. Венозна чорна і струмком, артеріальна яскрава і фонтанна. При венозній туга пов'язка і підняти кінцівку. При артеріальній накласти джгут вище та що і молитись. Бо поки ти зрозумієш, як накласти довбаний джгут, фонтан весь витлескається. Врешті перетягнула її ноги, як могла. Зв'язку немає, шок, що робити. Швидко одягла, максимально зібралися, як могли. Побігли до іншого будинку. Якось вдалося зловити інтернет. Написала по всіх групах, написала в типовий Маріуполь, дала адресу, дитину поранену. Приїхала поліція. Перелякали одне одного, мало нас не розстріляли, бо темно, мало там хто. Я кричу, дитина поранена. Тоді вже підійшли, подивилися, ми забираємо. Їй вісім років, куди б її забирати мене? У мене ще старша у підвалі. Або залишається зі старшою, або їдьте з меншою. I went with the little one, of course. And my eldest stayed put. We dashed through horrific shelling. We got to one hospital. They didn't open the door. Either no one was there or they didn't hear us. And one of the policemen shouted into a loudspeaker. The door stayed shut. We went to the emergency hospital. They took her. What's going on, I just don't understand. Soldiers were hugging me, they surrounded me. Oh no, it's a child. Stay strong, mama. I don't understand, I don't understand anything. Out came a doctor, I was shaking, my hands trembling. It was agony to look at him. 
I was so afraid of his face. And he said, people don't survive wounds like that. At least they don't walk away with both legs intact. We removed this. It was a millimeter away from the artery, a little curved cone. It's not shrapnel, it's the tip of an artillery shell, maybe a ricochet, I don't know. It went through one leg and got lodged in the other, here in the soft tissue. I don't know how that's possible, we just got very lucky. After the operation, they took us to hospital number three, to the trauma unit, and we slept silently until morning. That was the 8th of March, when it all started. И тут Сашка, хлопчик 15 років. Лікар мені кричить, тримай ліхтар, світи в рану. А я не можу дивитися, як людину ріжуть, дитину. Я розумію, що треба допомогти, але не можу. Запах, кров, м'ясо. Дали мужчині цей ліхтар, а він шмяк і з непритомних. Я дивлюся і думаю, господи, йому ж 15 років, це як моя старша. А він дивиться на мене і питає, я буду жити, я буду жити. Схопила цей ліхтар, руки трусяться, але тримаю, кажу, звісно, звичайно, жити може жити, ти дінешся. Ми навіть не могли всіх дірок на ньому порахувати. Чотири години полупали, крутимо його, а він весь скрізь, у шию, ну отак два пальці засунеш, у ногу вся моя рука увійде. Я буду жити, я буду жити. Він так хотів жити. Усе дістали, перев'язали. Була жінка з двома дітьми Аня. Каже, I don't know where my third child is, a newborn. She said, he got left behind somewhere in the hospital. А лікарі між собою кажуть, нема нікого у лікарні. І лікарні нема. Діти загинули. Казати їй, не казати. And I searched for my elder daughter. I drove everyone up the wall. I went into every basement, every alleyway I could. I met people, described my child, showed them pictures. <coughs> and I couldn't find her anywhere. I hoped against hope she knew we were at the hospital. I hoped she would somehow start moving towards us because I couldn't. The little one couldn't walk. We went out every so often to see who was there. If someone was more seriously injured, we took them. I saw a guy standing there in a t-shirt in the freezing cold with both hands bandaged. What's wrong with your hands, I asked. I can wait a bit longer, I'll cue. There were women and children, so he stood and waited. Forty minutes passed. He was still cueing. At last, again, what's wrong with your hands? A shell exploded. I fell to the ground, he said. And what do people usually do? Cover their heads, but in a pen, he'd splayed out his fingers like a rooster's comb. Look, he said. I bandaged them up. I don't even know what's underneath. And when he opened it up and we took a look, Jesus, we had to amputate, but with what? We can't just saw off seven fingers with a knife. We found something. We knew that there were some garden shears. And we cleaned them up, got to work, one finger at a time. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with on his knee. It just wasn't healing. A decent, a decent amount of time had passed and it wouldn't heal, and in the end, it turned out a piece of shrapnel was stuck in there. And when it came to the surface, we got it out, the wound more or less started to heal. She had given up hope of finding her child, it seemed. I guess she'd come to terms with it. But we'd hoarded so many nappies and so much formula. It'll come in useful. Everything well, I said. People came and took it with them. And in the end, can you believe it, some people came for formula, they told us that there was a newborn without a mother in another basement, and they brought the child. Is he yours? Duck? Me? Damn, I said. How's that possible? How? Not knowing whose child it was, someone had simply grabbed him, a newborn. Miracles do happen, but rarely. After that, it was so good. People came to have their dressings changed, and they brought things with them. A guy came and brought a fish. He'd only just caught it. I'll go and clean it, I said. And we lit a big campfire and had a feast. Fried fish, fish soup. Everyone was so happy. Працювали, як тримають відділення. У всіх фіксували. Ми питали, де отримав поранення, за яких обставин, домашня адреса, прізвище, ім'я. 
коли приходив і коли треба робити перев'язку. Сашки хлопчику ставало краще. Я його підтримувала. Якщо помоли він мені, тримайте мене за руку, будь ласка. У нього роздроблена ключиця і весь він бідний в цих дірках. Але він так хотів жити, почав сідати, почав їсти. Приїхав тато. Каже, я забираю. Shrapnel slashed through Sashka, black smoke and white stuffing from his puffer jacket. Our yard, yard dog howled for a really long time. The most horrifying thing was that we couldn't go out there. We couldn't go and get him. He sat there in that wheelchair for a week. His father ran away and there was nobody at all at Sashka. You get it. І вона ось так закрилася, куча, як у моєї полір волосся. Я на неї в напівтемряві дивлюся, ніжки, ніби моєї ніжки. У неї голова перекочується, я дивлюся, немає обличчя у дитини, повністю. У неї навіть кров не тече. Що показують у фільмах шахів, цього немає, просто біле м'ясо і все. І я все бачу, зуби, м'язи, я мало не збожеволена. Лікарі мені кажуть, та заспокойся, не вона це, там із нею мама, а я вже не вірю. Може, вони мені не хочуть говорити, заспокоюють. А може, просто жінка мамою назвалася, щоб прийняли. Підійшла до неї, сіла. Запитую, як звати вашу дівчинку? Каріна. Я мало не посиділа. Це мою, мою звуть Каріна. А ви точно мама? Вона, здається, навіть питання не почула. Каже, я з нею поряд сиділа. Чому мені нічого не сталося, а у моєї дитини немає обличчя? Then I went to see those Russian soldiers. I planned to ask them because I'd heard there were some kinds of lists of the living and the dead. They pointed me towards the man with the lists. He was imposing, obviously there for a reason, one of the high ups. Well, what could I do? I went up to him. I asked about my daughter, nothing. She was nowhere to be found, not among the living, not among the dead. I wondered whether I should mention my ex-husband or not. Just, I just knew that he'd kill me. I needed to find my child. He had connections, he could find her. I threw caution to the wind and said his name. It turned out that I'd stumbled upon someone who knew my ex-husband, can you imagine, just like that. And he said, they're looking for you. At the morgues, everywhere, let's go. I'm not going anywhere without my elder daughter, I said, until I know that she's alive. At least let us know where to find you. Write a note that, so that he'll believe you're alive. And I, I, wrote the, I wrote the note. He came by in the evening. I knew that he was coming for me, and that it was definitely about my daughter. Once again, I was afraid to look at his face. I was terrified. I stood up so tentatively and thought, I can't even go up to him. I'll run away. I went outside and he said, your daughter's alive. Is she in one piece? Where is she? In Donetsk. It's safe there. She's okay. It turned out that my elder daughter had escaped after a month. They'd seen that there were kids there, five of them, and they crammed them into a car. They waited there for 13 days in a field. The road, the fields, the shelling. The fields were mined. The sole of her foot was burnt in her trainers. I was so happy. I can't express it in words. It was just a miracle, just a miracle. For some reason, I got very lucky once again. Well, I left too. They took me to the nest. My ex-husband met me. They say that people don't change, and now I think that depends on the circumstances. It turned out he didn't know we were in my He thought we were with my brother in Lviv. He suddenly realized we lost contact with all of us. 
It's like I could sense it, he said. He saw a video of an eight-year-old girl dying. They were driving her to the hospital and he got so obsessed, kept saying, that's my younger daughter, I can see her, that's my daughter. He searched everywhere, at the morgues, everywhere. He found the doctor from the video and the nurse and tracked them all down, turned everything upside down, not a trace. Mentally, he buried his children. He was, he was a shadow of his former self. I even managed to raise my voice at him. I said that we would not, under any circumstances, say, stay in Donetsk. And he agreed. Go, he said. When I was praying in the bunker, well, talking, not praying, I wondered, why did we get separated? And then it hit me. If there had been three of us, one of us would have died, because it's Russian roulette. According to official data, 87,000 people died in Mariupol. But how many more are still unidentified, disappeared without a trace, buried under the rubble of apartment blocks? Before 24th of February, 430,000 people lived in that city, which means that approximately every fifth person died. Scene zero, a definition of war porn. How did you decide to flee the country? How does a person make that decision? Are your parents still in Ukraine? How are they? Are they afraid? Where are your friends now? Are you still in touch with them? How has the Russian war against Ukraine influenced your work? He oh, wrote the war in Ukraine, of course. You have to tell people about it because you are here to put words together and pronounce them. Dig words out of the soil where Russian rockets land and place them in the ears of people who live on soil where no, not a single rocket has landed since 1945. If you pick good enough words, then maybe these people will say, fine, you are a good storyteller. Well done, well done. And as a token of their gratitude, they will give you heavy weapons, ultra-heavy weapons. Weapons heavy enough to wipe the country of Pushkins and Dostoevskis from the face of the earth, to protect you and your parents and your friends and your lovers from their great culture, to leave their confused boys lying in the green grass with their jaws blown apart, guts hanging out, brains spilling out, blown off cocks, grinning teeth, just as they deserve. So, listen. Now we will do a trial of bloodletting, and as a foreword, I will tell you about <coughs> the waves of sirens in the clear sky in the second month of winter. The sound rises up and falls, danger above low hanging clouds, fighter planes, cruise missiles, aerial bombs, and then you go downstairs using the stairs, the lift is too dangerous. From the ninth floor to the first, you go into the yard and ask the bewildered parents of small children where the shelter is. They point to the basement. In the basement, small children step on concrete dust. It's hard for them to sit still for long in the shelter. The grown-ups discuss how to build a toilet. You read the news. You scroll through social media, media feeds. You think that you are too late. What are you planning to do, right? A man who, I don't know, a man who, a man that, whom you, but it's a story for another time. What are you planning to do? I think I will go to Lviv, I answer. Do it, he replies. And how do you feel right now? What do you feel right now? You feel like you are too late for everything. Scene two, the balcony equation. I'm standing at the Fiskulturna stop waiting for the trolley bus. In Kyiv, it's mid-December, freezing cold, minus 15 degrees. The time? 11 p.m. On the app, the little triangle of the trolley bus moves from the Olimpiska station to Palat Sporto station. Stop there. The driver, will be, the driver will take a cigarette break there, then start to drive in my direction. If he can get past all the snow heat on the roads. I'm watching. I'm waiting for the trolley bus. I don't value myself enough to call a taxi. I 
look at the snow. I think about the summer last year when I got off the metro at Palace Port to walk to the synagogue, went into the courtyard to look for the balcony of an old woman who was evacuated from Kyiv in 1942 with her aunt. The rest of the family stayed there, they were all killed in Babenjar. She wanted to come to Kyiv one last time to see the flat, the balcony, in the building next to the synagogue. She couldn't because of the COVID. She asked me to take a photo, go into the inner courtyard, there is a small balcony there, the first balcony in Kyiv. So I did. Not because of that woman, let's be honest, I didn't go there for her, rather was helping others with telling their story. It was a typical Ukrainian summer, unbearable, plus 34 degrees, I'm not, I'm inventing all this, I don't remember anything. I went into the courtyard and asked a local woman if she knew a balcony here that was the first in Kyiv. The woman looked at me wearily, but she pointed at something, and I took a photo of something, a balcony that looked like it might be the oldest and the first. It was actually the right one, but maybe that's just what Rahil wanted to believe. Does she remember the balcony? Would she recognize it nowadays? She said when her father put her on the evacuation train, he knew it would be the last time they saw one another. She didn't. I waited until the trolley bus came. It took me up one of the cliffs hills covered in snow to a flat with two balconies. This whole story is about the fact that those were my balconies in the flat I rented and I'm not there. And I know that I did everything right. And I know that I was afraid. And I know that I carry with me the sum of two balconies which have changed in my absence. Reality minus your presence plus time equals a different reality. With the balconies, you are one who is missing. Russians have stolen summer nights from us. The sun hangs in the sky for hours, covers your hair, exposes your legs so they match your white dress. When it finally goes down, everyone checks how long until curfew, half an hour or less. They wonder how fast they are prepared to walk, ask their friends if they are being late before and what kind of checks they were. Eventually, uh, eventually they get up to say goodbye, leaving the unfinished beer, lighting a cigarette on the way. They walk through the old town, touching the pavements with the soles of their trainers, looking at the angels wrapped in protective fabric in front of their cathedrals, wondering what the fabric will actually protect them from. They realize it's probably just to keep the debris in one place. They meet three girls on one of the one of them shouts, I never want to leave free leave. Another shouts, Yana, stop pissing around. It's nine minutes until curfew. Please, can we go already? The city is getting ready to fall asleep. The patrols aren't looking at passerby yet. The loudspeakers at the city hall are silent. Street musicians finish up their last songs, plucking their guitar strings, pushing their luck for 10 or 15 minutes more, playing songs like the Imagine. I hope that stone angels wrapped up in fabric will hear them and think there is certain irony to it. The stone angels have their time and someone has to. Scene 7, narrating the war. War is multitude of things that exist separately and they don't all describe war. You know them. Loneliness, time that's not enough and too much, sleep deprivation, tenderness, the practice of digging trenches, being covered and being brave, and vice versa. That phrase from Doctor Who when Doctor tells Clara that everyone gets stuck somewhere eventually in the planet trends the world meaning, meaning death. Writing this, I gaze at the list of things and think about how all together they can sum up war even though they are equally distributed across the whole world. In the morning of the 25th of February, I thought that I'd read too many books about war to be unafraid of dying, because I know how people can die. I've been lucky a lot of other people haven't. And when I think about these people, I think about the long, long train from Mariupol 
two million point. The gray sea of Azov is the silhouette of the steelworks on the right. The minibus to Irpin, the pine forest, there the Petit Rivis over Christ eclairs, the Twin Peaks restaurant in Kherson. Memory is the ability to tell stories, in spite of Russian rockets and Russian soldiers. A tragic ending one define these stories. Like war, Russian soldiers are multitude. We all know that stories about multitude don't exist. Now it doesn't seem so important, it will become clear afterwards. In short, loneliness, time that moves as it wishes, how are you and everything is calm here. Even the smallest donations make difference. All the balconies we've left behind, our exhaustion, dawn at 5 a.m., sirens that protect us, brave people who are also afraid. Stories about them that we are yet to narrate now and when it ends to you. Thank you. Uh, so, what I would like to do is um, introduce each of our speakers, give you a bit of context about how this project has developed, and then we'll hear from, um, hear from everybody and open the floor to questions. So, uh, we have uh, Anastasia Kosidi, who you have heard from already tonight. Anastasia is originally from Zaporizhia, currently based in Berlin. Um, she has worked in many of the top theaters in Ukraine. She's a co-founder of Ukraine's first democratically run playwriting collective, the Theater Playwrights, and uh, internationally has worked at the Maxim Gorky Theater, the Royal Court, and the Munchner Kammerspiel Theater. <laughs> Um, Katrina Penkova, author of the first play that you heard today, uh, is originally from Donetsk, currently based in Warsaw. She, um, many of her plays have been shortlisted in Ukraine's top playwriting festivals, <coughs> including a week of contemporary plays and drama UA. Um, more recently, her play Pork was the winner of a um, playwriting competition called Drama UA. Uh, no, sorry, Transmission UA Drama on the Move that was organized by Ukrainian Institute in Kiev. And Katrina is also a co founder of the Theater of Playwrights, which we'll talk a little bit more about tonight. Um, next, we have our intrepid interpreter, Marina Mikhailova. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, we have writer historian Oles Kramchuk, who um, is also the director of Ukrainian Institute London and the author of the book. Um, story of a Dead Soldier, told by his sister, which came out with Hachette earlier this year. Um, I'm, I'm Molly Flynn. Um, I am a, um, who am I? I'm a senior lecturer at Birkbeck, um, University of London, and the curator of this project, which we're calling Women in War. And um, this was a project that started in the first couple of months after the full-scale invasion, uh, when I was able to find some support to commission two short plays on this theme, this topic of women in war. And um, it seemed to me that Anastasia and Katrina were, were the two kind of first outstanding candidates um, to write about this topic. And I reached out to them in, I guess, April, around April, um, to see if they would be interested in writing texts on that theme in whatever way that they wanted to interpret it, and then to see where those texts would go. And at the time, we didn't necessarily know what would happen with them, but um, that's where we all started. And so uh, I wanted to start the conversation tonight by asking Anastasia and Katrina what the process was for you from the time that the plays were initially commissioned, how you were thinking of that theme, um, and how you moved from that moment into these uh, composing these texts as we heard them tonight. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, Molly wrote to me yeah, probably in April um, asking if it's possible to write a short text on this topic. And I have to say, when the full-scale Russian invasion started, we playwrights had quite a lot of work. Uh, surprisingly, because of the you know, very simple reasons, because it's uh, to a novelist you cannot commission a book that quickly about the playwright, can write a text that then will be put on stage. 
So before that, I was already writing a text uh, for Jam Factory in Lviv. It's a text called um, Eight Compositions About the Life of Ukrainians for the Western Audience. The title. Um, but that was, for me, in my head, a more tame text. Uh, because uh, the organization that asked me to write this text said that it will be translated to many languages and it should be kind of promoting Ukrainian culture around uh, around the world and Ukrainian view of this work. And I thought that, okay, I will say everything that I really, really want to say in the way how I want to say it for this text more. Um, so, and probably it shows in, in a way. Of course, it was a completely tormenting experience because so it's yeah ideal way of writing is uh, writing when you have sort of a you know distance between the topic and yourself which is now is not something that is possible and probably will not be possible for quite a long time so i sort of like starting writing it in term in a way of uh, focusing on some quite small details and from them going somewhere somewhere to bigger picture. Hopefully this worked. Yes. And, uh, yeah. um, I'm sorry, uh, I will speak in Ukrainian because uh, it is difficult for me to um, explain everything in English. Я на початку війни, фактично шість місяців першої війни, дуже активно приймала українських біженок у Варшаві. From the beginning of full scale war, uh, during the first six months, I participated in uh, helping the Ukrainian refugees, women refugees who came to Warsaw. І мені дуже важко було приступити до написання тексту, оскільки я була і фізично, і морально дуже зайнята. Ну, фактично, це займало цілий день. Я прокидалась в сьомій ранку, поверталась додому там у 12-й ночі, і це було нон-стоп, просто постійно. So it was very difficult for me to start writing because physically and emotionally I was quite exhausted because I woke up at 7 and finished my work at 12, uh, helping and rushing everywhere, so yeah, it was difficult for me to start. Ну, крім того, у мене в родині в квітні сталася особиста трагедія. Я не буду вдаватися в подробиці, бо вже бачила, як люди на це реагують, і потім нема дискусії. So I also want to add that I had my personal tragedy that happened in April and I don't want to tell about this right now because I saw how people reacted after that and the discussion stops. Ну, фактично, цей текст повстав через те, що я бачила дуже багато біженок, дуже багато історій і цей текст, він побудований на інтерв'ю біженки з Маріїкою. So because I saw a lot of refugees from Mariupol, from Ukraine, and especially from Mariupol, I talked to them, and they helped me to start this text, because I put all their stories, real stories, into the text that you had. So I'd like to add that this is the documentary. It's not something that I made up or somebody else made up. It's the real story, real stories that we heard that I heard from other refugees. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to these, these, some of these questions or some of these points that you've brought up. But, but first, I, I would like to um, get a little bit of further context from Melissa about about the theme of women in war as a um, historian of gender and war, I think I became, even though actually I, I've, I've known Alessia for many years and read some of her work before and have learned a lot from it, I don't think I ever really was cognizant of the complexities of the roles that women play during war times until this full-scale invasion when, um, when we, we really saw more and more the, um, I guess, the vast range of roles that women are playing during this war. And so I guess I wanted to ask you, Alessia, if you could just offer us a little bit of context on 
how you interpret the roles that women are playing since the full-scale invasion, to what extent that is um, consistent or different to the roles that women were playing in this war in the eight years before the full-scale invasion, and also how those um, roles are, are how they exist within a broader view of um, women in wartime historically over the last you know, 20th and 21st century. I know that's a huge question, but I think it would be really uh, helpful to hear your perspective on it. Thank you, Moni. Thanks a lot. Um, so I, I think what I'd like to begin with is to say something that might sound like, you know, something that's familiar to all of you. There's two misconceptions, main misconceptions about women in war. One, that, you know, somehow women get lumped into this group still to this day of women and children. In other words, people who need to be protected. Um, and the second is that women are lucky because they don't get drafted into the army, at least in the case of Ukraine. Uh, and the reality is very different to that. So. Uh, it's true, most vast majority of women experience wars generally, and this particular war in particular, um, as civilians. But that also means that they are not uh, armed, they don't have, have access to weapons, they don't have access to rations uh, like soldiers would. Uh, they don't have the, the protection of the institution, uh, if you know, as, as you would as a soldier. Um, it also means that uh, you know, the country that is um, that is in the middle of the war, the economy is geared towards the war, so they might lose their jobs, they might become destitute. The main breadwinners breadwinner, who tend to be men still, or the ones who earn more money in families tend to be men, are often drafted, or uh, you know, they, they find that the breadwinner isn't there, so that also affects the economic situation of the civilians. They have to look after dependents, uh, children, the elderly, younger siblings, um, neighbors who need help and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of additional responsibilities to what women usually do in addition to their jobs. Uh, they often become displaced. Um, so the, the reality is very complex and they have to deal with these enormous complex problems. Um, those who choose to leave, whether that's internal displacement or external displacement outside of the country, also become, um, you know, experience threat of being trafficked, for instance, right? So all of these uh, various complications. Um, and of course women are extremely active, like all citizens in Ukraine at the moment, uh, or vast majority of citizens in uh, the war effort. And that's doing everything um, from, um, I don't know, collecting money for provisions for the army, uh, or actually securing provisions for the army to uh, doing whatever they do in their jobs and making sure that it's geared towards uh, helping uh, the war effort to knitting masking nets when um, you know when they have after work when they when, when when they've done everything else that they were supposed to do and then they go for a few hours in the evening to do that or, or on Saturday morning or whenever. Um, in addition to that, and this is answering partly how it's changed since uh, 2014, many more women have joined the armed forces. Um, so I have the recent figures now that I can share. Uh, at the moment, it's nearly 60,000 women who are in the armed forces of Ukraine. It's difficult to say what the percentage, what that means, what have that translates into percentage, but it's roughly 20% of the armed forces. It's hard to say because we don't know the number of the armed forces as such. Uh, 40,000 of them are, or just over 40,000 of them are service women. Uh, 5,000 are in direct combat, participating in combat. Uh, over 100 have died, or as far as we know. Um, and uh, about 350 or so received the state awards, two of them here of Ukraine um, posthumously. So that gives you a bit of a scale of um, participation of women in the armed forces and the change, the, the real change from 2014, 15, 16 is that now women can be in the armed forces fully legally in any occupation or more or less any occupation for which they are qualified which didn't used to be the case. The legislation was such in Ukraine until 2016 that restricted women's participation in the armed forces significantly. Veterans and uh, um, uh, advocates for gender equality fought really, really hard to lift those restrictions. A lot of those were lifted in 2016 and subsequently as well. So it's much, uh, much more, um, I suppose, um, the, the army has become much more open to women's participation on more or less equal basis to, to men. Um, how has it changed, how, how does it compare to sort of historic role in, uh, of women in, um, 
uh, in wars. Well, I'd, I'd like to say things have changed, but to be honest, like the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. We still see the same problems that women face with. We still sadly see the same kind of stereotypes. So you know, the perceiving women's input. Uh, into war effort or the home front as secondary or auxiliary and so on. Um, but what I think is changing in Ukraine at the moment, and I really hope to believe that I am not being overly optimistic that it is really changing, is that the input of women and including service women is being valued uh, as just as important as any other. Uh, and service women, for instance, when we see them in the media, it's no longer to shame the men into action or to say, even women took up arms, you know, look, the whole of the society, you know, this sort of sensationalist uh, approach to talking about women. It's actually to say, here's a service woman, you know, she's serving in the same way as, uh, as men, and, you know, we, we're talking about her as we would talk about a service man as well. Um, yeah, um, a lot of women still join um, the territorial defense, for instance, as, as volunteers, they require I mean, they require help like everybody else, like everybody who's, who's part of the armed forces. And a very good friend of mine that I've, I've known for many years, she, she, she started uh, fighting in, uh, in Donbass in 2014, it was just really heavily wounded a few days ago, and I think she's familiar to all of us. Um, and that's because she was driving a, an ordinary car secured for by uh, volunteers and not uh, a, a, you know, a, an army vehicle that would have been, uh, you know, that would have, that could have uh, been appropriate for the terrain that she was trying to do, and she, she drove through a line. And, um, luckily, she's still alive and she's fighting for her life, but she's heavily wounded. So this is the reality in, in, in which all citizens of Ukraine find themselves in, and, and women, women too. Thank you. Thanks. I didn't know that actually. I didn't know that last part. Um, thank you, though. Thank you for that um, really, really helpful context. And uh, I, I would like to then kind of keep that in mind and, and bring it back to this question of your process and, and ask um, Master Katya more specifically how you ref reflected on the theme of women in war as you were approaching your writing, or if you reflected on it. It's also okay if you didn't. Um, yeah, no, I would love to hear how that process was for you. I have to say, I usually, I started to being a playwright in 2014, so I was kind of writing, writing about the war for the whole, like, yeah, nine years now already, and um, then, of course, the question of gender was always there, but uh, it was never that, central before somehow and now when I was writing this text I was like how in a way of course you're writing about women in war because you I don't know. and of course my uh, experience and experience of my friends, female friends it's, it's all that. I generally thought that um, yeah it, it you cannot of course base the text on the on your experience you want kind of to do the chorus of um, of experiences of other people, and uh, but I thought like how what is the you know what is the form that is possible for that because already I used to write more like classic plays before with like character A says to the character B um, and so on and there is a clear you know plot that goes uh, through the whole text but now it seems unethical to actually invent characters or write them based on certain people because these people can be alive, they can be dead, but anyways it's, I, I cannot bring myself to do that so how, what kind of form can be ethical and also true to the, to the things that are happening right now and uh, yeah, the way how I like to explain it is this, uh, a few years, a few, few months ago, I was in the uh, Theater of Shepney in, in Warsaw at the like, sort of joint Ukrainian event, and there was a colleague of mine, Dimitrovitsky, who was doing a performance where he just showed a photograph of a uh, photograph of Kiev Street. It's a photograph that was made this year, meaning so the war is happening already, but there is nothing that actually 
show us that it's wartime, and only if we really focus on the picture, then we start to notice certain things, for example, that in the pharmacy, that's at the street, all the windows are like blocked with uh, wooden panels, meaning that they were trying to protect the pharmacy from the, from the shelling, from the debris, and so on. And he's, he's very of working, he's just really focusing on small details and going to the bigger picture. And I thought maybe this is what actually, I always do this, maybe this is again the, uh, the approach. Um, yeah, and I also thought that it's nice sometimes not to hide. Because you know what I'm, I'm a, lot of, a, a lot of time now I'm writing for the German theater which is more intellectually driven and only then maybe we can show some emotions, most of them are age on stage. And here I thought maybe I can do a bit of a different approach and put more emotions into it and we'll see if it works or it will be just a horrible text. Um, yeah, because I mean, <laughs> in the end I think theater is about taking a risk. And, uh, yeah, so this is Мені здавалося, що мої особисті рефлексії, я не знаю, може я якби не маю на сьогоднішній день на них права, оскільки ну, якби, я не перебувала в Україні на момент початку війни, і мені здавалося, що я просто, ну, якби, ну, мій досвід не є настільки важливим. Може. I thought that I have no right to show my own reflections. Just because I was not in Ukraine when the whole war started, and I just thought that my experience is not that experience that I need to show. Я маю сказати, що теж пишу власне, теж я писала про цю війну, починаючи з 2018 року, оскільки сама я з Донецька, як вже було сказано, і моя родина пережила, як була в евакуації, скажімо так, до Києва ще. 2014. I'd like to add that I've been writing since 2014, when the war started, and as I told you, I'm from Donetsk, so my family knows what war is, and they fled to Kyiv in 2014, they had to do that, so for that reason I'm writing, I've been writing since that time. Я можу сказати, що, ну, звісно, що ну, мій досвід, може, трішки відрізнявся від тих, хто безпосередньо виїжджав з Києва або з інших частин України в момент початку війни, але у мене в Києві знаходився мій старший син, якому 15, і ну, якби він виїжджав фактично із старою бабцею. I need to say that I think my experience is a little bit different from those who fled from Ukraine and escaped from Ukraine when the full-scale war started. But personally, I know, I need to say that my son, who is just 15, he was in Kyiv when I was in study, and he had to flee with his elderly grandma. Я можу сказати, що дуже багато ну, відчуваю дійсно персонажку цього тексту, я відчуваю її дуже сильно, у неї є діти мого віку, ну, якби старші 15, менші 8, так як у мене, і я фактично ну, дуже сильно я не знаю, відчуваю дотичність до її досвіду. I need to say that I feel the main character of my story, just because she has kids, two kids, and one is 15, another is 8, mine are the same, 15 and 8, and I really feel that I feel everything that she says, I feel everything that she wants to show, and I feel everything that was written. Ну, бо нам дійсно просто пощастило, бо кожна з нас могла опинитись в подібній ситуації, коли ти живеш своє нормальне життя, ти ходиш по кав'ярнях, ти п'єш зранку каву, а потім раптом ти опиняєшся в середньовіччі, ти сидиш в підвалі, без зв'язку, без електрики, без нічого, і стає, ну, фактично обертаєш якусь абсолютно іншу професію, ти робиш просто те, що треба робити. I need to admit that we are just lucky and everybody can find out 
themselves from the same situation. One day you just live your life, you're happy, you just drink your coffee, you just go somewhere, and then another day you find out yourself in a dreadful situation, somehow like middle age, you need to live in a basement without electricity, water, connection, mobile connection, anything, and you just need to to learn how to do another totally different job and you need to be good in that. Thank you. Um, I want to ask one more question before we open it up to the audience. Uh, and that question is about the relation, and it's a question to all three of you, um, in terms of the relationship between your, your writing and your activism. And I want to uh, connect it actually to um, work that you're all three doing now in terms of responses to, to the All Out War that started in February, but also to the work that you were doing um, before that time. And in particular, I'm thinking of a play of Katya's called Buti Maestrum, which was about sexual, which is about sexual harassment in, in the theater world in Ukraine, which caused, which led to um, a, a big social movement, really, um, of awareness around that issue in a way that had never been seen in Ukraine before. And um, we were talking about it earlier in terms of texts that are kind of purposefully serving um, a social cause of activism versus texts that may not be. So I wonder if I could ask each of you just to reflect on the extent to which you see your writing as a form of social activism and um, if that has or has not changed as a result of, of well, I mean, I, I would say as a result of the war, although as we've already heard you both kind of identify as having started as playwrights in 2014, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alessia, but I think that in some ways your career as a creative writer also is deeply connected to the war. So, um, so in that sense, you are all three writers that have come of age as writers in this context, um, which obviously has an impact. So, yeah, could could you say a little, but maybe a few words about the play and. Yeah, the extent to which you see your writing as a form of activism. Well, Molly, you said that it's agree that uh, activism and playwriting has become one thing. They are, totally, they are fully connected and they can't be separated. Ну, якби текст, про який Молі згадала, бути майстром, тут присутня, наприклад, режисерка, яка робила читання цього тексту в Києві, Валерія. І, ну, якби я маю сказати, що ми, мабуть, обидві пережили ну, досить сильний пресинг після того, як вийшла стаття про цей текст і, в принципі, про цього діяча культурного. So the template was mentioned is really important and I want to say that the uh, person who is responsible for this text who made it is Valeria is in here and uh, we both uh, had some pressure after the article was released and um, we experienced this pressure after that. Але ну, на сьогоднішній день я вважаю, що абсолютно недаремно це було зроблено, і це дійсно дало якийсь поштовх до того, щоб це питання піднімалося в Україні, і ну, у нас почали виникати нові кейси, і вони дійсно були після цього. But it was not done for nothing. I think that after that it was like uh, the push or the trigger to start talking about that to open up new cases and to speak about new cases and to show new cases. Ну, якби інші актриси отримали якесь право голосу і можливість говорити про свій досвід, бо на жаль, на сьогоднішній день це існує в українському театрі і особливо в навчальних закладах. So they uh, it helped as actresses to speak up to show their own experience, to tell about their own experience, because, yeah, we must admit that it exists, it takes place in the theater, and especially in the educational establishments. 
Якщо повертатись до конкретно цього тексту, то теж у мене є відчуття, що є певна місія, мабуть. Ми маємо про це продовжувати говорити, і це також є частиною якогось активізму, певного. If to speak exactly about this text, I think that we need to talk about that, we need to come back to it and speak about that, because it's some kind of our mission, not to forget about that and to tell about that. Я маю на увазі текст про війну в Україні, яка триває. So it's about the text uh, that is about the war, which is in Ukraine, and which is still going on. Okay. I can add that uh, when I think the Polish invasion started and uh, I came to Berlin, I was surprised that actually probably theater was the mostly the most prepared institution because I know from my other class that there was yeah very little help and but the theater was you know not only finding like ways to take out people from Ukraine and to give them the accommodations and the work but they also gave a platform to uh, yeah to tell about the war and to, and not only of course German theaters also well poured and thank you Molly also helped us to we, we did the series of performative readings at the beginning of the war it was called from Greek for, about war and it was also in World War and it was in Berlin, Munich, uh, in Mannheim, in Vienna and uh, it was actually a big um, yeah a big movement of solidarity that was very very nice and um, and our institution, uh, Theatre of Playwrights, which both of us, me and Katya, are the founders of, and another 18, 18 uh, playwrights. Um, it was very good that we found it before the war, it was actually, uh, just to give a context, the theatre, uh, we, at the beginning we wanted to make a, a union of playwrights, because we thought that, you know, everyone has unions, like actors have unions, directors have unions. But playwrights actually never formed one, and we were kind of atomized. And then we gathered together for the playwriting workshop that was me and Maxim Kuryshkin were organizing. And we just started talking about very, you know, down-to-earth things, like how much we are paid, for example, for a text. And we, we discovered that it's, it, it, it's very different uh, payment, depending on many things. Like, you know, somebody is paid 50 euros for the whole text, and somebody is paid a few thousand. So we thought, okay, maybe the union is needed, but then we thought, okay, but maybe actually it would be better to make it the whole theater and then kind of show uh, this Ukrainian theater that is very like director based, a very yeah, you know, outdated uh, system, how actually they had have to treat the text. And we wrote a beautiful manifesto that starts from the lines that you know the text is the main thing in this theater of playwrights and the, see, and the playwright hires actually directors and actors and everybody else, which is a bit of a dreamy concept of course, but um, it, it's nice to risk and, and you know try to implement it into life, which we are doing actually because now theater is still working in Kyiv, it has its own place in a very beautiful part of Kyiv, just next to Postolo Plosha or Podil, and uh, yeah, and we are planning to do the series of reading polls without them. It's about our relations with Russians, and also the reading called uh, "Non Cherry Orchard." Um, it's organized by creator and also playwright Luda Tymoshenko, and it's basically uh, it's a short text. Every text is named by the name of the tree or plant because we discovered that oftentimes weapons are named after the trees or plants. So there are 15 texts that are yet yeah, sort of tell, uh, tell about the wars with this fourth. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Did you want to reflect on that question at all? Yeah, sure. I mean, even before 2014, and this was all the work that I've done, whether that was academic or creative theater making work, uh, was uh, a form of activism, I suppose. It was, uh, it was to bring about change. So when I wrote about, you know, in academia, when I wrote about the Second World War or the discussion of women in the war in Eastern Ukraine uh, or memory politics, that kind of stuff, it was, you know, to get people to think differently about some of the issues, to, to, to change the way we think of the theater. We wrote about 
um, undocumented migrants, for instance, you know, so it was very much kind of form of activism too. But since the start of the war in 2014, and obviously since the start of the full-scale invasion as well, things have changed in a more kind of radical way. I feel like I can't write anything unless there's call for action <laughs> in that text. Um, and I don't want to write anything else unless there's call for action, unless it's clear, unless there is guidance to my readers what they can do in order to bring about change, and that is victory for Ukraine. And victory means lasting peace, and lasting peace means justice. Uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of clear. And I think one of the reasons why I feel this uh, clarity of mission, I suppose, is because I'm not in Ukraine. And because I'm not in Ukraine, it means I'm in safety, and that safety um, calls for responsibility. Um, and so I feel, you know, that uh, I need to make sure that whatever I produce uh, has to be as effective as it, as it can possibly be. Um, and, and then encourage others to also bear witness from afar, from safety, but in a responsible way. In other words, contribute to, uh, in the most meaningful way that we can, each one of us can contribute in various ways, but it can always be meaningful, you know, in order to help those people who are inside the country who don't have the privilege that we do. Thank you so much. Um, I will open the floor to questions now. If we have anything, uh, any audience members would like to ask a question, we have a microphone as well, um, which is partly for us, but also partly for the recording staff. Thank you. Um, I'm interested, I know that the uh, Finbrough Pit has also had some Ukrainian play readings on it. They've also all been, I think, in their entirety by women. And I just wondered, because I know there's a sort of hit a Lesia Ukrainka and there's a sort of history in Ukraine of women as playwrights, but in most countries, women have really had to fight to, kind of, to get access to stages historically. Um, and I was thinking about what other Ukrainian playwrights I knew about before the war. And is this representation of women because the, men, the male playwrights are fighting, they're not there to, or is this because of the activism which has meant that women had already been sort of demanding you know, access to those stages and to, and, uh, to that voice? Yeah, great question. Thank you so much. To be honest, I think for me, in Ukraine, not the men were like those with whom I was like fighting for the stage, but mostly like black people because actually uh, most of, unfortunately, most of government-based theaters uh, tend still to put on the stage, you know, the plays that were written by people who died already because you don't have to pay royalties and uh, <laughs> many others and you also you can do whatever you want with the text. Um, and uh, I think I'm not wrong by telling that there are much more female playwrights in Ukraine than male ones. Yeah. Um, and um, actually I have no idea what is the reason. And yeah, and most of the writing, of course, after 2014, and also before that, relative to 2014, there was a clear reason it's very political. And yeah, as Natalia Vorosbit said, in 2014, now we will have a lot of topics to write about, unfortunately. And all of them are still kind of present. So yeah, it's more like trying what we did and what changed in a way in the last few years was kind of pushing the new drama written now to the stages and certain stages gave up and gave us the possibility to, to do that but still it was quite sad that you know a lot of directors hired brilliant playwrights but just asked them to write a what is called uh, uh, adaptation of a classic book or already existing play because they didn't want to risk it to put a new writing on stage. Which I hope now will change. And uh, yeah, hope now will change. Can I just add that Bless Your Brain also had the fight <laughs> to, to be heard and read and seen and perceived for, for what she was, uh, as opposed to for what people, for how people fit her into various stereotypes. And even after her death, uh, she continued to be perceived or presented by the Soviet regime in particular as a, a children's writer, which there's nothing wrong with being a children's writer, but that's not exactly, that's the, certainly not the only thing that she was. Um, but there, are, there are suddenly a lot more visible women, playwrights, directors, theatre directors, and film directors, which is 
something that I don't think we've seen until this kind of cultural renaissance in Ukraine, uh, which started, I, I suppose, started in 2014 or so. And maybe that is indicative of the change that I was talking about. You know, that the, the risk change that women are being recognized a lot more for the work that they produce. Um, and I'd, yeah, I'd like to hope that that is an example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Я можу лише сказати, що нам, мабуть, в середовищі саме в драматургічному пощастило більше. Ну, як би, в принципі, прийшовши в драматургічне середовище, я не відчувала того, що ми дійсно боремось з чоловіками за те, щоб наші тексти були прочитані. Maybe I need to say that uh, we are more likely uh, here in the theater because I didn't... Uh, in the, in the uh, yeah, the dramatology, yes. Yeah, so, uh, drama yeah, writing is a play writing because uh, I didn't feel any competition with men, with male, so I just didn't feel that. Ну, Настя, мабуть, вже про це сказала, що дійсно у нас є певне протистояння, мабуть, я не знаю, як це правильно сказати, української нині якоїсь нової драми із таким нашим театром українським, де все ще панують якісь закони, я не знаю, ну, 19-го сторіччя, мабуть. Maybe I would agree with Настя saying that uh, we have some kind of competition or maybe even fighting. Uh, with a new drama and to the traditional theatre and with some kind of 19th century thing and only this thing is what is the competition was right now. Ну, тобто не можна сказати, що саме війна вплинула на розвиток саме української драматургії. Я думаю, що на це більше вплинула робота, фестивалі, фестивальна робота і вже згадана Наприклад, і Наталія Ворожбит, і Максим Курочкін, і інші драматурги, які, ну, звісно, Андрій Май, якби український режисер, який створив теж драматичний конкурс. I can't say that the war influenced actually on the development of the writing and the drama. I would say that just war of such people as Максим Курочкін, Наталія Ворожбит, and others, and just their work influenced on that Good evening. Uh, my name is Oksana. I'm very happy to see Anastasia and Olesi here and um, uh, to um, to uh, present and listen to your uh, texts. All of you, thank you very much for your work. I have two questions actually. One is um, referring to the beginning of Anastasia's uh, play tonight, how um, cultural workers, anyone from Ukraine actually, has been expected to be the storyteller, this narrator to the West uh, about Ukraine and to be a good one, you know, fitting in a way this kind of Western gaze. And uh, I can guess, and I also heard this from um, uh, different speeches of some of you, how tiring it can be and how we uh, myself included, face this lack of knowledge about nuance of our context. Um, so my question is, um, assuming that you also see your uh, creative work as part of that um, storytelling um, exercise or burden or mission, do you see the shift in uh, understanding or in uh, the, 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 the uh, understanding and knowledge about our context as a result of this work? or? Does it feel sometimes like a drop in the sand, maybe, uh, which I assume is also fine, sad, but fine. Um, and I really welcome an honest answer. And um, my second question is, um, a lot of us have started to talk about post-war Ukraine, whenever and, um, that happens, we also try to approach this post-war futures as uh, much as we can. What do you uh, think the role of creative industries and, and theatre in particular is or should be in post-war Ukraine because to be honest I don't see a lot of conversations about culture at all in post-war recovery of Ukraine. We are talking about infrastructure clearly, roads, hospitals, very hard stuff but uh, culture is not on the agenda from what I know. Maybe you know something else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, about the, the shift, I was uh, I was at the event in, in Berlin in just a few days with Natalka Snedjanka, very famous Ukrainian novelist. And we were just talking with her that it's very visible in the audience when certain people came to the events like that before because you see by the eyes and by, I don't know, like by nodding and by the questions that they ask that they already have quite a lot of context. And so, and this uh, is quite nice because then you understand that, okay, this is not all in, in vain, that all these discussions and all these readings, it actually builds certain, um, yeah, certain group of people and people are interested and they are, you know, so I would say the reader shift because in 2017, when I was in Berlin, I was horrified because I was supposed to be writing the play, write a play about the war, but I, you know, people couldn't tell the difference between Crimea and Donetsk. And then what kind of play can you write? Do you have to write a textbook about the history of Ukraine, but nobody wants to watch it because, yeah, it's serious, it's entertainment after all, you have to entertain. And now it's uh, there is a difference, of course. There is a lot of what about it and still in society, uh, but there are also a lot of people who pay attention. And, uh, I'm I'm trying to be positive about it. And um, and about the role of Ukrainian culture in a post-war society. I know. I mean, I think in theatre we are most more or less prepared. If the government will not be interested in. Yeah, restoring the culture because the whole life I'm re living in Ukraine. I mean, a few last years, Ukrainian Institute appeared, also Ukrainian Cultural Foundation. These are organizations that uh, funded the culture, but still, it was as horrible as possible to get these grants and as horrible as possible to kind of you know do the bureaucratic things to um, explain where you actually spend the money. And every time, it was kind of a a magic trick uh, to explain how your play will somehow magically fix society. Because first it won't, but this is what you have to write in the grant application. Uh, so, yeah, I think even if the government as it is, that is, yes, unfortunately, it's very focused on the mass culture in a bad way, because Zelensky himself is a person who comes from quite a horrible, bad taste mass culture. Uh, if they will not be interested in you know, restoring the theatre, then we will do it ourselves. I mean, we've done it the whole life. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Я хотіла би додати до другого питання, що, скажімо так, до війни фактично процес пішов, і у нас дійсно, ну якби і в театрі, і в кіно були дуже великі вже якісь, ну якісь дових вперед, так? Можна сказати, що ми були в тому ж самому стані, як, наприклад, у 2010-му. I'd like to add something to the second question, because I would say that before 2014, our theater and the cinema in Ukraine started to develop. And you can't compare 2014 and 2010, for example, because uh, there were some changes and some crucial changes. Я маю на увазі, що до 24 лютого, якби фактично у нас ну, були можливості щось створювати, так ну як її було достатньо багато. So before 20, uh, 24th of February, we had opportunities to create new things, we had opportunities to work. And we had a lot of opportunities. І мені здається, що зроблено достатньо багато для того, щоб цей процес можна було продовжити. And I think that we have done a lot to continue this process in the future. Just briefly on the first question about the shift, uh, I feel like, I've, like many of us here, I think I feel like I've been working as a full-time Ukrainian for the last nine months or so. <laughs> uh, so if, if so many of us work as full-time Ukrainians, there's going to be a shift. And I think the main shift that I've noticed is that, uh, you know, whose voices are seen as credible. Uh, I don't think Ukrainians have to prove the right to exist anymore, nor do they have to um, 
uh, persuade the interlocutor that they uh, are their voices are credible, that they should be listened to. I think that's where the shift has happened. It hasn't happened entirely yet, but it's basically you know poor taste and I see a panel with no U Ukraine experts on the panel talking about Ukraine. It still happens all over the world, but fewer and fewer of those happen. And when the organizers are, you know, it's pointed out to the organizers, they tend to fix it and invite somebody, even if it's last minute. And people don't tend to speak on our behalf as much. Um, I don't really see so many Russia experts explaining Ukraine, as was the case for the first eight years of the war, and certainly it's also since the full-scale uh, full invasion too. So there's a shift there. It's a pity that the price for that shift is so high, so many deaths, and also that it is kind of dependent on the victory on the battlefield. Um, because until the army started to uh, prove that they can be victorious, um, there was still, you know, hesitance to believe Ukrainian story. Uh, but the, the more we see positive changes on the battlefield, the more Ukrainians are listened to. And just to add the gendered element to this discussion, uh, it's often still a male and military voice that is listened to. It's often still a victorious soldier or a president wearing a sort of, you know, a semi-uniform that is listened to, um, rather than, for instance, a, you know, a, a, an expert female voice that is perceived as equally credible. So, more work to be done, for sure. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Hi, so um, the question is related to the, um, the consequences of the war. So how can we actually elevate um, the consequences in relation to um, abuse that is happening at home uh, for Ukrainian, for example, women? Um, so how can we... We know that uh, the violence obviously grows during the, um, um, during the war and everything, and we know that um, there was obviously the violence from Russians how do we deal uh, from the internal, so how do we t uh, deal with the internal <coughs> problems, uh, like the man who's running from wars and, uh, you know, um, having their own scars, uh, they're ultimately going to bring it to home, right, and the women had to manage the whole family and they had to support it and they had to go for the loss of the job and everything, so how do we practically elevate those consequences and uh, can we do it through the theatre? Thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. I don't think we can answer it quickly here, but what, what I can say is these questions are being raised and have been raised for, for years and years, since the start of the war in 2014. There's, there are some fantastic NGOs working in Ukraine with women who are suffering from gender-based violence, from domestic violence related to war, but also now um, um, conflict-related sexual violence, so perpetrated by, by the enemy in most cases, right? Um, I, I can, you know, I can only speak about the uh, non-state um, initiatives at the moment that are fantastic. Some of them are international organizations, some of them are Ukraine-based, or if they are international, they're still very much rooted in Ukrainian expertise and people working on the ground, survivors working with victims and so on. Um, so I'm very hopeful that, you know, the, the, the tools are there, the organization are there, they will continue to develop. They need support, they need our support for sure, they need funding, they need people and so on. Um, I can't comment on state initiatives yet. I know that it's going to be a huge issue for everybody involved. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, will affect the country and already affects the country hugely. We've seen the consequences of this. For the first eight years of the war, it'll be just much, much larger because the war is so much, the, the scale of the war is so much bigger. So it's going to be a, you know, a, a challenge that will absolutely have to be dealt with, and I just really, really hope that it's high up on the agenda um, in the state as well as in the NGO sector. Thank you. We do need to wrap up in a few minutes, so if we have a couple more questions, maybe we would take them at once. Or do we have just the one question here, and then are there any other questions? One over here. Okay, let's see. No? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's, just <laughs> let's take both questions and then we'll um, answer all together. Thank uh, you. My question is just in the context of some of the stuff we've talked about, uh, or you've talked about so far. Um, uh, do you feel, do you have an idea in your head about who you're writing for, who you're writing these stories for? Um, obviously, there's this pressure to write stories like internationally, it's kind of irritating. <laughs> but also, do you think about maybe 
um, writing for like the future, you know, Ukraine for the future, or you know, future generations of Ukrainians um, as well. Great, thank you. And let's take the second question too, and then we'll answer that together. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to come back to the point of the call to action, uh, which Alessia mentioned earlier, and ask you both, Anastasia and um, Katerina, about your experience of sharing these plays with international audiences, and from the discussions that you've been having, what you feel are the most important things that you want to communicate to people, to people here. Thank you. So I think I will start answering because the questions are sort of connected. And uh, I think on a very practical level, I personally am trying to write because my audience is mostly, well, German audience. Of course, German audience also is not one audience. It depends on the city, on the land, on the yeah, on the audience of the of the, the theater. Right now, I'm writing the play for the. National Theatre Mannheim, where I will be uh, the house author Wien and the director. And it's a bit easier because I'm a director and so I kind of do everything, prepare everything for myself to put it down on stage. Uh, but of course, it's I'm not sure that I'm very successful in that because in the end, any place that I write for German audience will be much more understandable and closer in Ukraine for Ukrainian audience than in Germany because uh, certain things you cannot explain, I mean, either you have to spend the whole scene on explaining it, for example, when you write, like, well, city is not there, but the city, but the sea stays. This is what, very famous line about Mariupol. And then, it's, everybody in Ukraine understand, in Ukraine understand that, but with German audience you have to explain it also. There are different, of course, ways of perceiving uh, the theatrical text, Ukrainian, Audience, although of course, the yeah, actor general is like that, but I would say um, it's more a bit more sentimental audience. The audience that loves emotions showed in stage was like Germans and all in that. And there are also I, I, I asked like my, my friends who are German playwrights, and I was like, what actually works in stage? And they they answered me very weird things, like for example the the rage works on stage, right? As you honestly, as you know, probably Germans like to yell on stage a lot, and it's really, and it's not. Uh, it's sometimes just like intellectual yelling. It's like sort of, a, it's not connected to the to the emotion. Sometimes it is, or like they really laugh and you write a story. Well, for a long period of time, you cannot say something very important, like that what you feel, but what exactly? And um, but of course, of course, it's all like like playwrights and tricks, and uh, in the end, of course, I'm writing for experience. But I'm trying to, yeah, to understand what works. Because again, as Wes said, as Katya said, it's now everybody is like 27 full scale Ukraine, and uh, it's it's a big also responsibility to kind of, yeah, tell the stories. У мене не так багато досвіду написання текстів для неукраїнської публіки. I don't have so much experience writing text for non-Ukrainian audience. Я маю декілька постановок в українських театрах, і ну моїм першим досвідом власне роботи для неукраїнського неукраїнського глядача було написання тексту в воркшопі в Польщі. So mostly I have uh, several performances for the Ukrainian theater, but I also have experience in writing uh, some text for the workshop in Poland. Ну і дуже дивно було пояснювати перекладачу, яка є полькою, ну, наприклад, такі речі, які для українського контексту абсолютно зрозумілі. Наприклад, вона запитала, чому ти пишеш, що твоїм батькам на весілля подарували шпалери? <laughs> so and it was very difficult to explain to the interpreter who was Polish herself uh, some things that were really obvious for Ukrainians. For example, she asked such a question as like, why do you write uh, that um, your parents were gifted the wallpapers for their marriage? Like, why such a gift? And I have 
дуже важко переключитись і зрозуміти, що не все може бути перекладено і не все може бути зрозуміло для глядача, який не виріс із тобою, скажімо так, в одному інформаційному полі. What I want to say is that sometimes it's quite difficult to write something that will be understood uh, by others who are not from your environment, who are not growing up with you in the same society, and also that there are some things that um, can't be translated because it's just a cultural thing and it's not interpreted, not translated. But I can tell you that in Poland and in principle Та дискусія, яку ми мали в Оксфорді, ну, лишили дуже приємні враження. Мені здається, що ну, можна дійти до якогось діалогу. So, but still, I want to say that experience that we had in Poland and also experience that we had in Oxford, the discussion that we had was quite positive for me and uh, yeah, it just some beginning of some positive development, I think. I just have a general comment about will it be useful for future generations as well. I think, I think this war is so um, well documented in many ways because we have such huge presence of the media, we have social media, you know, we constantly, constantly feel like we're watching it live unfold. Um, but what theatre does, especially documentary theatre, that it it in a different way. I think it documents trauma in a different way as well. And I really think that it will, it already is and it will become a very important instrument for processing that trauma, both now, as we experience it, and in the future. Thank you. Um, I just want to say one more time what an honor it is to be here with all of you. Thank you for your work. Um, thank you for joining us, Alessia. Thank you for joining us, Marina. And thank you to all of you for um, your presence, your questions, and your support. And I hope that we can continue this conversation um, in the bar. And thank you, Molly Flynn.